Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our dear Lord and our Savior Jesus. Amen. Our texts are the lessons that we've already read today. As we focus today on this concept that God's uh, generosity in Jesus, the greatest gift, is an abundant generosity. And uh, as we've been tracking through these weeks, we've seen that, first of all, God's generosity is intentional. It begins in his, his mind uh, as a plan. It worked out in his heart because he willed, wanted to do it. Uh, secondly, that it's faith-filled that when Jesus stepped into this world, there was no guarantee that people would follow, listen, and receive the gifts that he brings. And yet, here we are, 2,000 years later, doing just that as we celebrate this great gift. Today, we focus on, on this concept that God always gives abundantly. And, um, and out of that abundance then invites us into the same kind of abundant generosity in our lives. And then next week as we near Christmas then, that, uh, that God's generosity is always incarnational. That it's literally a skin on, in the flesh kind of generosity. Um, today we're going to focus on this, this concept, this understanding from Scripture that God's generosity is abundant. And and I was at a conference once, and they were talking about God's abundance in our lives, and, and they uh, said this question, if you don't think God's uh, gifts to you are abundant, uh, just go into your closet and look at the number of shoes that you have. Okay? I don't know about you, but I, I got uh, two pairs of dress shoes. I got one that I wear with brown and today a, a, a green suit, and, and another one that I wear when I have black on, okay, because they're black shoes. They got a match, at least so I'm told, right? And then I got another uh, couple of shoes that I wear with jeans uh, that are more casual than the kind I would wear when I come to church. And then I've got other shoes uh, for exercise. I've got a pair of basketball shoes. I've got a pair of running shoes. I've got a pair of cross-training kind of shoes. I, uh, you know, I've got all kinds of shoes. I got boots that I wore this morning when I was... Uh, was uh, snow blowing the drive. Um, and then I've got a different set of boots that are not as well insulated, but are great for walking around in swamps if you need to do that kind of thing. There's all kinds of shoes that we have. I've got a different set of shoes that I use. Uh, uh, they're more of a, of a, of a uh, trail walking kind of shoe, and I use those in, in that kind of context. So you know, if I think about shoes, I know that I've got abundance, and I've been in places where people either didn't have any, or maybe had one pair, and that's all they had. We live in a, a world of abundance, and we not only can count shoes, we can count the number of shirts that we have. We've, you know, I, I've still got some shirts from last Christmas I haven't taken out of the wrapping yet because I don't need them yet, you know. And... I know that I live in a world in abundance. Uh, another way to get at that is to think about uh, how many screens you have of television. You know, very seldom does anybody have what I had when I was growing up, one 19-inch black and white television, right? Um, now we've got multiple screens. That's why when you get, you know, cable or something like that, they bring in a splitter, right? And they got to split it. And you have to decide how many different rooms you want it in. Jerry and I went on a vacation once with her sister and her brother-in-law and a, another couple of friends we've known ever since high school. And um, uh, we went to San Diego. We rented a house, homeway.com, had 11 screens. 11 screens. Two of them were outside. One was in the outside patio area, and one was actually up near a place where they had a specific place there, kind of on their roof where you could go sunbathing kind of thing, and they had a, a screen up there too. Just phenomenal, right? But who has just one little 19-inch black and white television anymore? Um, we live in an age of abundance, or all you have to do is look at the presents uh, in and around a tree. Um, I had Friday off, so we did a lot of wrapping. And then the question is, what do we do with them? Because they don't all fit under our tree, and some of them are for different uh, uh, gatherings with different sets of relatives. Now, imagine my mother-in-law. She has 40, I think it's now 49 people she buys for every year, and they all get more than one gift. Can you imagine what that tree looks like when we go over for Christmas with that side of the family? Usually we all get like three things. There's 150 gifts, roughly, under that tree. And those are just from her, you know. 
Um, we live in an age of abundance, and of course that abundance becomes very clear when, especially when you have children and you have to say, well, what are we going to do with the new gifts because the playroom's already full. So sometimes you've got to do some recycling and decide maybe there's some that we need to pass on to somebody else. We live in a, a land of abundance, and, and that abundance we recognize comes from the hand of of a good and gracious God who is abundant in his generosity in our lives. And, and we have an abundantly generous deity who calls that, us then to be abundantly generous disciples. Well, how do we get at that abundant generosity? Well, that's reflected all over the place in the Bible. Uh, this is my children's lesson, and, and one of those images in the Old Testament of this abundant generosity is in Psalm 23. You know it. It's, um, it's where this happens. It says, my cup runneth over, right? Um, <clears throat> there's a wonderful book that um, Dave Ramsey set me on to from... Uh, uh, from, written by a rabbi, and what he talks about is how in Jewish homes that use some very traditional prayers, there's a prayer that's used on the Sabbath that prays that God would give to this family more than what they need. Now, to us at first blush, it sounds kind of selfish, doesn't it? Give me more than what I need. But the point that he makes is that they use this illustration of the cup running over. God, I would love to have more than what I need so that I can be a blessing in the life of somebody else. That in the abundance of your generosity to me, I can be generous with somebody else. My cup runs over, you see, for a purpose. I'm reminded of that kind of abundance every time I go past a corner that uh, I traveled regularly in my first parish. Um, it's at the intersection of Highway 49 and 23, about 20 miles west of Oshkosh, um, Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Auroraville, and Trinity Lutheran Church in Borth were the first two congregations I pastored. And, and that corner was uh, the major intersection. It was the only stop sign between uh, Amro and um, Red Granite. Um, there was no other place to stop. And actually, when you first got to that corner, there was nothing there when we first moved there in 1980. The mill was actually a mile north of that road in Auroraville. It was one of three main remaining mills in the state of Wisconsin that still operated with a water wheel, with water from a mill pond driving the mill itself. Now, since that time, it's been converted into electric energy because the state shut down the the mill pond on them, but when I got there, they were still operating as a mill pond uh, mill. And there were, of course, these kind of big metal uh, containers that they had uh, to the storage uh, units that they had to put the corn in, uh, but in the time that I was there, first, that wasn't enough, so then they went down on the corner of 23 and 49, and if you drive through there, you see it all the time. There's a bunch more of these big silver um, uh, storage containers. And, and then it was, I think we were there about four or five years, and those weren't enough. And then they had to pour it out on the ground. And then they put like this uh, white mesh kind of thing to protect it from the elements until it can be sold and shipped. But the abundance that God has given us, you remember Jesus told a story like that about a, a rich man who fit into his... his uh, his barns, and so he decided he was going to make more and sit back and take life easy. Well, you and I recognize, whether it's personally or in the harvest that comes into our, our nation, that we are uh, uh, an abundantly blessed people with an abundantly generous God. And it's this abundant generosity that Isaiah points to as a sign of the Messianic age for them. Now, the people of Israel had been through a time when the crops hadn't been growing so well. God had not blessed them because they had walked away from him. And, and God promises them that he's going to restore that to them and then uh, gives them a picture of the Messianic age. And, and all of these pictures are about abundance. The first abundance is that there's going to be abundant life returning to the desert, to the dry and parched land. He says, uh, 
uh, in the beginning of that prophecy, and the desert and the parched land will be glad, the wilderness will rejoice and blossom, and like the crocus, it'll bloom. And, and, and you and I can imagine what this meant to them because they'd been suffering for a lack of what they needed, and it was going to be restored. And God uses that to point then toward the abundant life that God gives in the messianic servant who's, who's coming. It's an abundant life that that's also includes abundant healing. And so he says, uh, in that day, the blind are going to receive their sight. Those who can't hear will be able to hear again. The lame will leap like a deer. Um, those things will come true in the day of the Messiah, in the day of that promised one that I talked about already, and we've, we've already read in chapter 2 this, this year and in chapter 11 of the book of the prophet Isaiah. And that, that, that uh, event will bring abundant joy. He says, gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. That joy will be so abundant um, in that day of the messianic age that, that, that the sorrow will dissipate because of the joy that the Messiah brings. And you and I know that actually came true in the gift of the abundant generosity of our God when he sent his son Jesus into this world. And Jesus mirrored that kind of abundant generosity in his own life. Uh, two particular events stand out, both having to do with multiplication of something for drink and for food. One is uh, the, um, the, the turning of water into wine, the very first miracle that Jesus did, recorded in John chapter 2. Now think about it, they've uh, been feasting for a little bit and they run out of wine, a typical marriage feast, and the New Testament age lasted anywhere from three days to a week because people had to walk to get there and they had to walk back home when they were done. It was the one time you could plan to be together for a joyous occasion and, and uh, celebrate, and so they spent a lot of time together. Well, they ran out of wine, we know the story. And Mary, Jesus' mother, comes to him, and, and we know then Jesus goes to some, <clears throat> some servants and says, fill those, and there were six um, big clay pots, each held 20 to 30 gallons, fill them with water, then draw some out, take it to the master of the feast. And they do that, and of course, it's wine, and it's the best wine. It's better than what they've been drinking up until this time. One of the things I always do when I teach this, and I get to teach it in eighth grade usually in uh, confirmation class because we go through the Gospel of John, is I have them do the math. How much wine is that? Well, think about it. 20 to 30 gallons at 128 ounces per gallon, all right? Mul do the multiplication and then divide it by about six ounces of wine, which would be a fairly generous portion of wine, glass of wine. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of wine there. And, and there's not only a lot of wine there, but if you understand that they usually drank their table wine cut 50-50 with water to make it stretch a little bit more, there's a lot, a lot of wine there. Way more than they needed. And that's the way Jesus is so often as he gives gifts to his children is that he is abundantly generous. He doesn't just provide what they need. He provides a cup that runs over. The same thing happens, you and I read a little bit later in John chapter 6 in the uh, feeding of the 5,000. And remember 5,000, Matthew tells us, is just the men, not the women and children. And, and Jesus has a couple of loaves, uh, a, a, a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish and, and he blesses it, breaks it, and it feeds all of the people who are there, and the disciples go out and gather up 12 baskets of leftovers. When Jesus blesses, he blesses abundantly. And it's this abundance in terms of the action of Jesus, and that's what it says, John heard what Jesus was doing, the deeds of this Jesus, and he sent his disciples to ask, are you the one or should we expect somebody else? And what does Jesus say? Look back to Isaiah 35. The blind have received their sight. The lame are walking. The lepers are healed. The deaf can hear. The good news has been preached to the poor. In other words, you might say Jesus is saying, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it must be a... If it looks like Messiah and acts like Messiah, it must be Messiah. 
I'm the one that Isaiah spoke about. And, and you and I know that the reason he entered this world was not to be abundantly generous at a wedding or abundantly generous in, on a mountaintop, but to be abundantly generous in the grace and forgiveness that you and I would need. And, and when you think about what God says, the images he uses ab about his forgiveness, we see an abundant generosity there. As the psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sins from you. Now, tell me, if you're walking east, do you ever get west? Not as long as you're on a globe, right? There's always further east you can go. And the point that he's making is when he removes sins, there's no way that those sins can come near to touch you again. Or from the book of the prophet Isaiah, and God just gave us a wonderful demonstration of this, right, last night. A little bit earlier in the book of the prophet Isaiah, God says, come, let's reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they'll be white as snow. And he's not just talking about a dusting. He's talking about a blanket that's feet deep, that can't be penetrated anymore. That when God blesses us with forgiveness, the blood that was shed on Calvary's hill uh, and the sign and seal of it we get every time we come to the Lord's Supper is a reminder how abundantly generous our Lord Jesus is. That he covers our sin perfectly so that we can then reflect that abundant generosity in our own, own lives. Jesus pointed to that kind of abundant generosity in his disciples when you remember he saw the widow who brought the widow's mite and he said, they all gave out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty. And he pointed to her generosity as a sign of, of, of God's generosity as well. I know I experienced this a, a few times, and, and one of those great times was um, when we were in Uganda last. And... Um, and it didn't matter where we went. We knew these people were primarily subsistence farmers, but every church we went to, every school we went to, and every home we went to, somebody had to give us something. Had to give us something. Um, and when you and I understand how richly God has blessed us, and when you and I see opportunities to serve, then we reflect the abundant generosity of our Heavenly Father as his disciples, and a great uh, story that illustrates that kind of uh, abundant generosity in the life of one of Jesus' disciples, Lee Strobel tells in his book called The Case for Christmas. Now, if you know Lee Strobel, you know he is a working journalist for the Chicago Tribune. He was an atheist who reported on um, primarily legal matters, and uh, he, in his book, tells about this experience that he had while he was still an unbeliever. And he was assigned to report on the struggle of an impoverished inner city family in Chicago who weeks before Christmas had um, had, had a, a devastating fire that burned a roach-fested uh, uh, tenement that they had been living in. And now they were living in a little two, tiny two-room apartment on the west side. And he was given the assignment to go interview them, and, and uh, what he says is, is that he was mildly, to say the least, surprised by the family's attitude in spite of their circumstances. Their names were the Delgados, and it, this family consisted of a 60-year-old grandma, Perfecta, her name is, and her granddaughters, Lydia and Jenny. And they were living now in this... Um, this little apartment, and Lee says, as I walked in, I couldn't believe how empty the apartment was. There was no furniture, there were no rugs, there was nothing on the walls, there was only a small kitchen table and one handful of rice in a bowl. That's it. They were virtually devoid of possessions. In fact, the 11-year-old Lydia and her 13-year-old Jenny owned only one short-sleeved dress apiece, plus one thin grain sweater between them. And when they walked their half mile to school through the biting Chicago cold, Lydia would wear the sweater for part of the distance and then hand it off to her shivering sister who would wear it the rest of the way. And yet, he said, when I walked into their, their apartment, despite their poverty, 
Despite the painful arthritis that kept Perfecta from working, she talked confidently about her faith in Jesus. She was convinced that they had not been abandoned by him. And he said, I never sensed despair or self-pity in her home. Instead, there was a gentle feeling of hope and peace. Well, Strobel finished his article and and then moved on during the rest of that Christmas season to more high-profile assignments in the area of law. But when the Christmas Eve arrived, he didn't have church on his radar, so he, he found his thoughts drifting back to Delgado's and their unflinching belief in God's providence in his care. Uh, Lee says it this way, I continue to rescue with the irony of the situation. There was a, here was a family that had nothing but faith, and yet they seemed happy. While I had everything I needed materially, but lacked faith, and inside I felt as empty and as barren as their apartment. And so in the middle of Christmas Eve day, a slow news day, Strobel decided to revisit the Delgados. And when he arrived, he was amazed at what he saw. Because, you see, readers to his article had responded to the family's need in an overwhelming fashion. They filled the apartment with donations. He saw new furniture, appliances, rugs, and a large Christmas tree, and stacks of wrapped presents, bags of food, and a large selection of winter clothing. Readers had even donated a generous amount of cash. But Strobel says when he went back into that apartment, it wasn't the gifts that shocked him an atheist in the middle of Christmas generosity. It was the family's response to that, those gifts. In his words, he says again, as surprised as I was by this outpouring into their lives, I was even more astonished by my visit uh, and what it was interrupting. Perfecta and her granddaughters were getting ready to give away much of their newfound wealth. And when I asked Perfecta why, she replied in halting English, well, our neighbors are still in need, and we cannot have plenty while they have nothing. This is what Jesus would want us to do. Lee writes, well, that blew me away. If I'd been in their position in that time in my life, I would have been hoarding everything. I asked Perfecta what she thought about the generosity of the people who had sent all these goodies, and again, her response amazed me. She said, This is wonderful, and it's very good. But she said, we did nothing to deserve this. We recognize it's all from God's hand. But we also know it's not his greatest gift. No, the greatest gift we celebrate tomorrow. And that is the gift of his son, Jesus. Lee says, to her, this child in the manger was the undeserved gift that meant everything. More than Muriel material possessions, more than comfort, more than security. And at that moment, he said, something inside of me wanted desperately to know this Jesus because, you see, in a sense, I saw him in Perfecta and her granddaughters. They had peace despite their poverty, while I had anxiety despite my plenty. They knew the joy of generosity, while I only knew the loneliness of ambition. They looked heavenward for hope, while I only looked out for myself, and they experienced the wonder of the spiritual while I was shackled to the shallowness of the material. And something made me long for what they had, or more accurately, for the one they knew. Jesus invites us to appreciate the abundant generosity of the Heavenly Father who for our sakes, he who was rich became poor, so that we might have the full richness of God in him. That's an abundant generosity. He calls us to enjoy in the forgiveness that though our sins are like scarlet, has made it white as snow, and invites us to enjoy as we express it in our own lives in the way he calls us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, please rise. May this now, <clears throat> the peace uh, uh, that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in your Jesus and to life everlasting. Amen. Let's confess our faith.